what in the world is going on in the Middle East? And how is nobody talking about the prophecy in Daniel 8? This is just incredible, incredible to me. When you think of the conflict that's going on right now in 2024, it's currently August of 2024, and you have this war going on after, what is it, 10 months, nine or 10 months with Israel and Hamas, Hezbollah, but really with, uh, that's the proxies of Iran or Iran. Uh, it's incredible that this is going on and that nobody's talking about Daniel 8. It's almost like the prophecy has been hidden or people have been blinded to it on purpose. We know that there are things like this in the Bible, right? You've all read things in the Bible that you see it clearly, but when you try to explain it to somebody you know, who you consider to be, you know, as intelligent as you are, but when you explain it to them, they don't get it, right? You're like, why is it that I can explain this Bible? I can see this Bible topic this issue, whatever it is, I understand it. Why can't you understand it, right? And you can't make the other person see it or understand it. And we know it's because it's it's a spiritual thing, it seems, that the Father decides who understands it. He takes the scales off of our eyes and lets us see his truth, uh, I guess, because he knows what's in our heart and how we're going to act on it. And sometimes it seems like this with this prophecy in Daniel 8, where uh, so many people, Christians or believers or many people who read the Bible, they believe that it's a fulfilled prophecy. It's in the past. It's one of these prophecies that they think doesn't apply to us now. And yet when you read through the whole chapter of Daniel 8, you obviously that see that the last, say, five verses are obviously talking about the Antichrist. The, the language is so clear that it even matches up with a lot of the same language, the same almost word-for-word -word description of what the Antichrist, how he's described in, uh, I think it's Revelation, maybe 13, chapter 13, somewhere around there in Revelation when it starts talking about this, the son of perdition, the, well, that's in um, 2 Thessalonians 2. You should read that too. Compare Daniel 8, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I think it's uh, Revelation 13, if I'm not mistaken. Let me take a look. Yes, absolutely. L Revelation 13, all through there. You'll see a lot of the language lines up in all. Do a little study of those three chapters, and especially the second half of Daniel 8. But now, why that, that everyone could say, oh, well, it's looked like that many times throughout history. And this is why Daniel 8 is so important and why I don't understand why more people aren't speaking about it. The beginning of Daniel 8 specifically mentions these two beasts, and then the, the archangel Gabriel comes and explains it to Daniel. Ah, the sheep that you saw, the, the male sheep or the hairy sheep or the, um, the shaggy sheep, and the ram, well, they represent two countries, two peoples. The ram with two horns is Persia. Everyone knows that Persia is Iran. Uh, Persia... The, the, they themselves call themselves Persians, the people from that area, from Iran. So it says Persia and Media, Persia and Media, or Media. And Media, if you look on old, um, find an old Bible map, and you'll see that Persia coincides with the whole land of uh, even current, uh, current Iran. Um, but Media is like the northern part of Iraq. So it's basically that whole area there. And, it, and it, it turns out that Iran is, I'm, the way I understand it, they are kind of controlling that area of Iraq right now. And they have their proxies in all these other countries, Hezbollah, Hamas, and whoever, whoever else they're using. Um, but read the description. It says that that goat with the two horns, which is Persia and Media, that they are pushing against, pushing west, pushing north, and pushing south. But they're not pushing east. And Iran isn't fighting against the east. The east would be Afghanistan. I don't think they have any conflict in that direction, but I could be wrong. But they're pushing in the other directions. Um, and they they're, they have more enemies than just the U.S. and Israel. Um, the other ones just don't say much about it, but it's not like they're their friends. I'm pretty sure like Saudi Arabia and a lot of those countries, they're not in love with the Iranians. Um, and again, when I say Iran, I mean more the, um, more the, the leadership the, the Ayatollah and the leaders, the presidents, whoever runs the country, not the people. I've met Iranian people in other countries 
and I've never been to Iran, but um, I've met Iranians in the U.S. and then in Colombia, and they were wonderful. They were extremely friendly and nice and polite, and we had nice conversations about different topics. And so, yeah, and we would even bring up like, you know, I would say, but what about, you know, with the history of the U.S.? And a lot of things that went on, I could understand it because the U.S. went in there and did a regime change with the Shah of Iran. Um, the way I understand it, Iran actually had a, like um, a democratic uh, government going on. And then the U.S. or something, U.S. and England went in there and they did a regime, one of their, you know, CIA regime change things. And they got out the um, whoever was in there and they, they installed the Shah of Iran, their you know, previous king. And then the Iranians are the ones that got rid of him. And ever since then, there's been problems. So it's amazing that Iranians um, have a pretty good attitude toward America or Americans anyway. But I could understand, like, it's sad when these countries go into places and do these. It's beyond sad. It's a understatement, right? Um, it's a sin. It's terrible that they should do it, but it, it happened. It's history. And now we have all, we have so many conflicts going on. Uh, but we know that they say that America is the great Satan and that Israel is, the, I guess, the little Satan. Uh, but so we see these conflicts going on and it's building up and it's just getting worse and worse. And right now too, as of the, uh, it's August um, 9th, August 9th of uh 2024, there's the conflict between uh, Israel and Iran is really getting tense right now. Israel has um, attacked and assassinated some of their leaders, and they're even admitting to it. Usually they would keep that a secret in the past. And then um, so we're just waiting for Iran to strike back, or maybe it has already, and I haven't checked the news today. Uh, but this is just how much is this going to build up? And then how is it finally going to drag America in there? Because America is already sending its ships over there, the United States, America. They're sending their ships and their military over there, of course, to support Israel. But how are they going to get dragged into it? And the reason I believe this is in Daniel 8, read Daniel 8. It says that this goat, which finally the Archangel Gabriel, yes, he says that it's Grecia or Greece. Well, come on. In the end times, is Greece, the little tiny country of Greece in Southern Europe, are they going to fight against Iran? Or are you saying that it represents some greater Europe? Okay, I'm saying it represents America. Why? I know in previous videos, and uh, maybe you don't, you haven't seen them recently, I made them a long time ago, I talk a lot about, and I still believe that America is Babylon. I have no problem believing that one thing can be symbolized in two ways. It happens a lot of times in the Bible. Uh, there can be more than one symbol attributed to a person or a city or a country or a people. And I believe in this case, the symbol is Greece. And it makes perfect sense to use the symbol of Greece for America um, because of so many things. You'll see in some of my past videos, just, um, just off the top of my head, it's like the Statue of Liberty is even called, if you go to the Statue of Liberty in the United States, it's called the New Colossus. Colossus was the Colossus of Rhodes. That was part of Greece. Greece was known for its great navy. America's known for its um, strong military. Um, why was the New Testament written in Greek and not in Hebrew or Aramaic, the language of all the people who wrote the New Testament? It was written in Greek because Greek was the lingua franca of that time. What is English? English is the lingua franca of the world right now. Um, that's where you can go, and I've experienced this. You can go almost anywhere if it's a non-English speaking country, and you can find a job teaching English. If you're a native speaker, everything's written and done in English in international business. In most cases, that's the language that people use with each other, uh, even though it's not their first language. Um, and there's a lot of other similarities between uh, Hollywood and the, the Greek theater. Um, uh, democracy, the birth of democracy in, in Greece and America. And you could argue this uh, a place that supposedly is a very democratic place, but we can argue about that for a long time, obviously, because um, we're having a lot of problems with that now. But uh, there's so many similarities. But then it says this. It says that this shaggy goat, that's the one that's Greece, comes over the, so the whole surface of the earth without touching the earth. That's what it says in the prophecy. Daniel says it. Read it for yourself. Daniel 8 says it goes over the whole surface of the earth without touching the earth. What kind of goat is that, that it could fly over the earth? Obviously, it's the United States or it's a country that can come over the whole surface of it. And the other thing, the reason I don't think it's Greece is because Greece is only separated from Persia by one country. That's Turkey. 
Turkey is the only landmass in between there. To say that from Greece over Turkey to uh, Iran is the whole surface of the earth. It's an exaggeration. Okay, you can exaggerate things in stories, definitely. But definitely from the U.S. coming all the way over the Atlantic Ocean, coming all the way around the earth, that is much more fitting. And coming by sea or by air over to Iran. And that's what they did. They didn't touch the surface of the earth. They came by sea or by air or by sea and air to come to Iran. They haven't attacked yet, but that's what it says is gonna happen. And that's when all of these end time events are gonna unfold. And that's why this is so incredible because we were all wondering, people are saying, um, where are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Are we in that time yet? Well, this is the, like, the first domino. When this happens, when the attack, when the US attacks Iran, it hasn't happened yet. The US has not, as of today, the US has not physically attacked, openly attacked. And the word in the in Daniel 8 is trample. It specifically uses trample because it's talking about these two beasts. It says that the shaggy goat, the Greece or America in that I think, it comes over and it tramples on the ram and it breaks its two horns and nobody comes to its aid and it tramples it. After that, a short time after that, now the, the shaggy horn, it says it has one horn coming out of its forehead. That horn is its king, and it says it's the first king. Wow, I think it's talking about George Washington, um, but some people interpret that word first as meaning the number one or the leader. Like we, a lot of people say, like whoever is the president of the United States is like the leader, the leading leader in the world. It's the one that everyone notices and uh, focuses on. And so um, who knows when or if this is going to happen or how it's going to happen. But I definitely have my focus, um, my eyes uh, on there a little bit. I'm always trying to look at a few different things. Prophecy is not the main issue in my life as a follower of Yeshua, of Jesus. It is, uh, it's kind of down there. Actually, I haven't been paying much attention to it in recent years. I focus more on Christian living, on how to make a difference and not be a hypocrite and be a as much as possible, we all are. We all, none of us live up to <clears throat> the, the the gifts that we've been given. But that's that's the thing I focus on: uh, how I can use my gifts, how to help other people, make a difference. So that day when I'm face to face with Yeshua, you know, He's going to say, "What did you do with all that I gave you? With all the blessings that I gave you, all of your gifts, all of your talents? What did you do with them? Did I just fold my arms? Oh, I buried my talent." Or did I actually do something? Was I making a difference? Whatever way, we all we all have different abilities and gifts. And I know that the Father and Yeshua look at us, they love us, and they're fair. And so no two people need to act the same way. We're not apostles. You know, we're, um, we're, we're just us. But what are we doing with the gifts that we have? These are the most important things in my life. But still, considering the times that we're living in in this world, it is definitely, a th it, some people say that about one third of the Bible is prophecy. So should we ignore it completely? There's people who say that, no, don't read the book of Revelation. That's not for us. Nobody can understand it. It wouldn't be there if we weren't supposed to at least read it once. All of these prophecies, Old and New Testament, they're all over the Bible. Most of them are pointing to Yeshua, to Jesus, but a, a lot of them are after that. And they're pointing to his, sec to his first coming and to his second coming. And it is important. And they line up, the ones in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they all line up. It's one book. It's really one book, the Bible. Um, and so it makes sense that they would line up and there's one author, there's just 66 scribes, 66 books, little books, but it's one big book and one author. That's the father and the son. They authored the book. Yeshua is the word. And so we should know this stuff. We should take a look at it. I encourage you, take a look at Daniel 8. Tell me what you think. Um, if you believe that it's, it's fulfilled prophecy, fine, you can put that. But if I'm, I'm interested to know if you can see some of the similarities in Daniel 8 to what's going on now, because it talks about how it goes across the whole surface of the earth. It tramples it. But then after that, this is the interesting part. After it tramples Persia, the one, the, the horn is broken. So it sounds like the king, something happens to him. He's broken. How you can interpret that a million different ways. He's assassinated. He dies of a heart attack. He dies of natural, unnatural. He's just kicked out. He's impeached. Who knows what happens to him? But this leader is out. 
And then it says that that country, so if it is the U.S., this is where it really gets interesting. It says that country gets split into four parts. Now everyone's like, ah, forget it. You stop. I'm not interested in anymore. That's not going to happen. Oh, that never happened in history. A country never got divided in two. Germany, remember World War II? That's not even very distant uh, history. If you think about it, that's just in the last hundred years or so that Germany was divided in two and then reunited. And how many other countries have been divided, split up, brought back together, borders moved? It's just because it's America. You're thinking it's impossible. It can't happen. Why? Why? Uh, historically, 260 whatever years, that's not so long for a country. It could be split up. People are talking about problems in the country as it is. I'm not encouraging this, nor do I want it. I'm saying that in the Bible, it says that whatever this country is, that this shaggy goat, where it comes from, that after the horn is broken, it's split up into four parts. And what's interesting, again, now, if you can take that next step, out of one of the parts, uh, a horn pops up. The horn, again, horns are used to represent leaders. One of those horns is replaced and another horn comes up and he's called the little horn. And the little horn, a lot of you know, is terminology used for the beast, for the antichrist, for the son of perdition, for, oh, he has so many different names in the Bible. Um, so this little horn, and how do we know he's the antichrist? Because he says he wants to be God. He wants to be worshiped as God. Satan always identifies himself that way, right? Even when Satan came face to face with Yeshua during his 40 day fast, and when Yeshua went into the desert and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, um, Satan said, if you bow down to me and worship me, something like that, I'm paraphrasing. Satan, he, he's single-minded. He wants one thing. He wants to replace God. He wants to sit in God's throne, to be like God, and he wants humanity to worship him. I, I think he's so out of his mind, he even wants uh, Yeshua and the angels and God himself to worship him. It's the Father himself to worship him. It's, um, uh, yeah, it's Satan. And so he, it says that this little horn, he does it. He speaks blasphemous things. And he, and he similar language from Thessalonians 2, read 2 Thessal Thessalonians 2 and uh, Revelation 13. Compare those three chapters. You'll be amazed. The language lines up. Yeah, I've talked about it in some of my other videos, but I encourage you to do it because if you find it yourself, it'll be more meaningful. But uh, keep your eyes on what's going on there because, uh, I mean, this, this is unfolding right before us. This could be in our very near future, uh, this, these attacks. And if, if America gets dragged into this and has to defend Israel because bigger and bigger, you know, eventually these, um, what do they call it? The Iron Dome and the uh, David's uh, sling and all these different things that they're using to protect. Eventually, uh, a bigger, something bigger can get through. And especially if someone else like, say, Turkey decides to help out. But something can come through and maybe hit terrible. It's terrible to think about Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or whatever. No, they probably wouldn't attack Jerusalem. Um, and think how this, this is how wars escalate. This is how wars escalate. A lot of people are saying World War III, World War III, um, with all the different areas in the world. So keep an eye on this. Keep prayerful about it. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I, you know, the Father, pray to the Father and Yeshua to keep, open your eyes and be in your heart and your mind. And um, we need to be examples to other people at this time to study the word, know the word, because it says, he who has an ear, let him hear. It doesn't say he who has an eye, let him see. Because by our eyes, we will be deceived. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that this antichrist type character, this son of perdition, he will do great wonder, great deceiving wonders, lying wonders, so that they would deceive people. People are, even back in the time of, of Yeshua, Herod, what did Herod say? Oh, show me a sign. Like he wanted to see some, like he believed it was like magic. Uh, people, that's what people say. They say, oh, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. Show, if you could show me something, I would believe it. Well, I'm sorry to say those people are going to see some miracles. And, but it's, they, and then they'll believe in the wrong thing. Because just because somebody can do a miracle, it doesn't mean that it's good. A, a miracle in itself 
even if it, on the uh, the surface it looks like it's it's good like healing or something like this healing somebody who's blind or whatever it doesn't mean that it's good if it doesn't come from god even if it's not accompanied by truth and and it and that truth should match what it says in the bible remember satan quotes the bible he misquotes it like a lot of people do nowadays there's a lot of false information and misquoting and lying it's prevalent in our whole world so we it says he who has an ear let him hear and that means you study the bible and you understand it in context don't study single verses study the whole chapter that's why i'm encouraging you and i'm not quoting a verse today i'm telling you to read these scriptures study the whole chapter for itself sometimes even the chapter isn't enough you need to look at the chapters before and after to see the whole context but definitely read these chapters that i mentioned compare them Pray, pray before you, pray before you study, because the Father can open your eyes, and um, he can help you to understand what you're reading. He helps us to understand what we're reading, uh, and then look at it, and then when you know the scriptures so well, and if you haven't read the Bible, just start at Genesis. Read right through to the end of Revelation. Just do it. Just do it every day. Be reading the Bible every single day. Know it. If you don't like reading, there's Bible on tape. There's Bible and there's different versions of it. So there's a King James, a more traditional one, and they have them in different languages too, if your language is in English. And then they have more modern ones that you can listen to. Listen to the Bible when you're driving your car, when you're working around the house or in your yard, uh, but or read the Bible or both. But we need to know scriptures. You need to know what it actually says because the enemy is gonna quote scripture the Antichrist, he's going to, I imagine, I don't know if you if you agree with me, that he will be somebody charismatic. He's going to be incredible. He's going to convince and deceive people. And he's going to use scripture probably because he's going to be one of, he wants to be worshipped as God, but he's going to misuse scripture. He's going to twist it, take a word out here, add a word there. And if you're not studying the Bible, this religious kind of talk is going to confuse you and fool you. And he's doing his miracles too at the same time. And you're going to think, he must be God. He must be Jesus. He must be, or God and Jesus. All that is all a lie. It was just something from aliens or whatever they say, whatever their lie is. We got to know the Bible, study it, know what it says so that when the deception comes, when the lies come, and maybe they're coming already, you can spot them and you can say, no way. That's a lie. I'm not going to fall for that. Think about how quickly and easily people were manipulated with the whole COVID thing, with all the, you know, um, just all the stuff that went on in that, the pressure with, oh, you got to wear the mask. You got to do this. You got to separate. You got to, and, and people fell for it. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, don't do that. You're going to kill somebody's grandmother and all the, all the shenanigans that went on um, and the way people were manipulated. That was a psychological experiment. So that happened, and that happened fast. That happened within weeks and months, and definitely by a, and, and some people are still affected by it. But like the brainwashing. So imagine when it's satanic. I'm not, maybe that's satanic too. Yeah, because it comes from pharmakia and pharmacy and drugs and all that, but, and money. But imagine when it's coming from Satan and it's the Antichrist and he wants us, he wants people to worship him and the mark of the beast in the hand to buy and sell from Revelation. Uh, that's Revelation 13 also. Uh, this is brethren, brothers, sisters, friends. We need to be reading the Bible. No matter who you are out there, even if you don't think of yourself as a religious person, I don't feel like I'm a religious person. This is life or death. This is our eternity. Our Father in heaven, he's saying, look, be part of my family. Be part of my family. Here's the instruction book. I'm not just leaving you out there on your own. I'm giving you the instructions. Study it. I made sure that this book is the most printed book in the world. We have no excuse. And you can read it in your language. It's printed in every language. And in English, if you speak English, it's in. we have more translations than any other language. We have more translation. Now you might say, oh, it's translated so many different ways. Now, even if you take the worst translation of the Bible, whatever you think that is, because some people think, ah, oh, this translation is bad. Even if you took the worst translation of the Bible and did everything it said in it, I think this world would still be a much better place. I'm not saying go for the worst translation. Get a good one. Get the best one. Study it. Get your interlinear Bible and your Strong's Concordance. And there's so many tools you can use now to look up the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic words. Study the Bible like your life depended on it. Because it does. Study it. We 
Absolutely, we have salvation in Yeshua, the Messiah, in Jesus Christ. He saves us. But bad times are coming. Bad times are coming. And we should know what it says. Don't you feel a responsibility? It's his word. Don't you want to study it and know what his words? Isn't that important to you? You would do that with any in any human secular situation, right? If you had a teacher or, or somebody who you respected and they wrote a book, you would read it. You would know what it says. Or if you wrote it, you would want people to read it, respect it and do what it says. We're talking about our father in heaven. We're talking about God. We're talking about the almighty, the creator and his son. It's their word. We're going to just ignore it. It's their instruction booklet. Look, it says here, this is the way to live. Follow these words. Live by it. It says that in the New Testament too, not just the Old. It says, if you, if you believe this stuff, if you, if you have love in your heart, without going into all the scriptures in, in, in John, and in many places in the New Testament, it says that. Live by these, and we should walk the way Yeshua walked. It says that we should do that. We should walk as he walked. We should do these things. We should know these words. So please study Daniel 8. Let me know what you think about it. I hope you enjoyed this.